and welcome as we kick off this webinar in careers with STEM technology. Uh, as you're beginning to join us, please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, where you're from and where you're joining from today. My name is Heather Catchpole. I am the founder of Careers with STEM and I welcome you to this webinar about technology and cybersecurity careers. I'm joining you today from Gadigal country of the Eora Nation in Sydney, and I would like to pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging, and to the original First Nations innovators in technology, science and engineering. So today we're looking at technology and last week we launched the 31st issue of Careers with STEM and we're taking a closer look at the T in technology. You can grab these magazines, download them, read them for free online, and they also go to all Australian schools. This issue, we have a flip cover in cybersecurity special edition as well. And we're really fortunate to be joined by three of the people in this magazine to talk about their careers, give you some tips and hints on what working in technology means and how to get there. So as new technology emerges, Tech uh, becomes far more than the stereotype of coding in the basement. In fact, if you work in technology, you can work in agriculture, retail, conservation, arts, music. There's really no end to the careers and they're hiring faster than most other sectors. But we have a bit of a diversity problem um, in getting people into tech and a bit of a discrepancy between the way that technology and cybersecurity jobs are growing and the enrolments you might be surprised to know that one in 16 Australians work in technology careers and that technology is in fact uh, growing since, uh, since 2005, it's grown by 66% technology careers compared to an average growth rate of 35%. So it's growing uh, almost twice as fast as other career areas, which is why we're gonna get excited about this today. Um, yet only 12% of uni enrolments are actually in IT and engineering degrees. So if you're just starting and getting into technology and cybersecurity, your options are really endless. So today we're gonna to have a deep dive into the magazine. We're gonna look at the basics of technology careers. We're gonna look at some emerging sectors. We're gonna look at how you can combine technology with your passion, uh, with your interest or with a whole nother field. So we call that, at Cruise with STEM, we call that STEM plus X, because we believe that STEM is a foundation uh, set of skills that can get you to so many different areas. So welcome, and we'll be hopping into some screen sharing first, and then we'll be popping on to um, spend some time with our STEM professionals. So first off, I'd just like to say thanks to our amazing sponsors, Google and the Commonwealth Bank, who are all about busting those stereotypes about what being in cybersecurity means. So you might have a kind of sense of STEM as, you know, the old white male scientists working in the lab, the, the you know, guy coding in the basement, someone wearing a hard hat, some kind of genius doing maths. So, you know, nowadays, nothing could be further from the truth, and we'd like to bust some of those stereotypes. So my business partner and I founded Careers with STEM eight years ago um, as a way to do just that. We produce regular magazines, one per term across each of the STEM areas. And we also produce issue deep dives into cybersecurity, into hot areas such as space, into apprenticeships and traineeships, and also into looking at different um, areas of diversity in STEM careers. At the Careers with STEM website, you can find updated news, videos, and do career quizzes. You can search by your STEM or by your X in science, technology, engineering, and maths, um, and also by areas of interest like creativity, games, health, the environment, or space. So if you're at this webinar, this is your opportunity to ask some questions and find out some things um, from people who are working in the area. If you're on um, joining by our YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe. We do do these webinars for each issue and you're halfway there to getting yourself a good kickstart into a STEM career. But if you are in this webinar, you might be into tech already. You might be, you know, the kind of go-to tech whiz in your family or your friendship circle, fixing and building and helping everyone with their IT issues even if it's just turning it on and off again. 
Um, so you maybe, you know, you've been coding since you're a kid and since you've been, you know, walking and talking. So if this sounds right, then you might be wanting to consider a straight up tech path. And there's plenty of demands for careers in computer science and software engineering. You could work as a software engineer and earn up to 102,000 per year. Or you could work as a user experience designer, creating products for people and earning up to 118,000 a year. Or you could be a development operations or DevOps engineer and earn up to 126,000 a year. So the, the opportunities are really great in tech careers. And as I say, you can work in all sorts of sectors. It's really not just tech companies, the opportunities are endless. But that's not all. There's actually a bunch of jobs that are being created all the time as technology changes and develops. And some of these are really transforming the way that society works as a whole and the way that the world of work happens as well. Like machine learning engineers who work on automating technologies, data scientists that analyze and decipher data, and mechanical engineers who are developing whole new systems. AI and quantum technology are transforming society in really major ways, and you could be part of that, delivering better healthcare and medicine, helping combat misinformation and hate speech in social media, for example, or developing cool tech for agriculture, manufacturing, and defense. QUT's Ricky Nyack and her colleagues analyzed 1 million tweets using AI to detect tweets that are abusive towards women, for example. While quantum technology is enabling early disease detection in breast cancer and improving medical imaging. So there's really amazing practical results in these really exciting growing technology areas. If you're passionate about social justice, you might be considering a career in social work or working for a charity or aid organization. But have you thought about combining your want to help attitude with technology skills for a career that can make a real difference? If you're interested in combining tech plus working for social good, there are plenty of opportunities for you. Tech and data are helping to fuel an unprecedented movement for social justice all around the world, including aiding social protests and, and social movements like Black Lives Matter. But tech for social good is about more than harnessing the power of social media or hashtag activism. It can really make a profound difference. Um, if you're passionate about the environment, for example, you could build an app like Greener, which rewards consumers for shopping more sustainably. Or Impact, which is a program developed through the UN World Food for, uh, Program to empower refugees by providing digital skills through vocational training programs. If making the world more inclusive is important to you, you could be involved in a project like the Story Sign app. This enriches, enriches story time uh, for hearing impaired children and their parents. Ibobly is a social and emotional wellbeing app designed by and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that supports mental health by drawing on stories, images, and videos from a digital artists and performers. So the opportunities are endless and really creative if you've got the drive to make a difference. Ultimately, technology is neither good nor bad on its own. Famous tech philanthropist Melinda Gates says it's a tool and what matters is how we use it. Now, if you're anywhere around the world, and particularly in Australia lately, you might have received a spam message or a call recently. Cybersecurity is one of the fastest growing career areas. There are employers all over the world looking to hire people proficient in protecting their data. Posts for jobs in cybersecurity have risen three times faster than overall IT jobs, which, as you'll remember, are growing twice as fast as other jobs. Working in cybersecurity, you'll be a cyber bodyguard, accessing careers under the cybersecurity umbrella, such as ethical hackers, security architects, engineers, and cryptographers. It might sound complex, but if you've got a desire to learn, good perception, an inquisitive nature, good communication, and an eye for detail, then cybersecurity could be for you. Jobs in cybersecurity don't have to be just for the banks and the government. There are plenty of jobs everywhere, in big brands like Tesla and Apple, uh, in startups, there's a colossal demand for people and there's no shortage of employers. And as we'll hear, the jobs are really rewarding, exciting and team-based and you get to work with some really amazing people. If you are interested in tech careers and you're looking for a place to start, um, there's a bunch of kind of, you know, simple things that you can do to get yourself started. If you're currently at school, uh, choosing electives such as digital technologies and design and technologies, 
uh, is really important and see if your school has a coding club. If it doesn't, it's really easy to start one and there's programs out there that can help you start one at your school. Uh, you can easily start to learn programming yourself and there's heaps of community out there to make it really fun. Uh, start with the basics like Scratch and moving on to YouTube or code.org to upskill. Uh, there's plenty of tutorials on, tu on YouTube to get you started and big and great communities that you can join like GitHub or Open Processing, which is this fantastic art and code based community. I'm part of it and I really recommend it. I love it. Uh, it keeps you motivated and it keeps you learning. On YouTube, uh, check out Laconic Machine Learning, whose aim is to teach you computer science in a thousand videos. Um, or if you can look out for competitions like the Australian STEM Video Game Challenge and Grok Academy's learning resources on programming and cybersecurity. If you're after some inspiration, on the other hand, there's a bunch of awesome people to follow, like software on engineer Lauren Medalia, aka Coder Girl on Instagram, or MisoDope on TikTok. If you have other suggestions, um, please do pop them in the chat. We'd love to hear if there's anyone who you've been following who you find really cool as well. And don't forget that this December is Hour of Code. Uh, that's a really fun way to kind of get started and start learning some stuff in programming. There are also plenty of study pathways to choose from. So if you're getting into university or thinking about traineeships, um, there's plenty of options out there. It doesn't need to be just a straight IT degree. You can diversify into data and medicine, gaming and design, communications and media, security and law, and so much more. Combining tech with these other skills uh, will really give you the edge. Uh, check out our Career System website for study paths, and you can find heaps of opportunities to get you started there. But I would love to move straight into welcoming our panel today. Um, and chat, chat with some real technologists who can work in an exciting range of careers and to tell you about their own inspiration and paths, which might not be what you think as well. So if you're with us live, get your questions ready. And if you want to read more about these STEM professionals and follow up on their journeys, uh, you can check them out at careerswithstem.com. So first up, I would love to introduce Harrison Boogie who is a security engineer at Google and our magazine cover star. As a security oh. engineer, hey Harrison, um, I'll just give you your intro so we, you know, we know how, how cool you are before we, people get to meet you. As a, as a security engineer, Harrison is responsible for defending Google by building detection systems that enable Google to see potential threats to information security. He studied a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science and a Master of Science in Information Technology and worked on IT roles before transitioning into security engineering. Harrison is passionate about helping others. He mentors Google engineers and other people interested in STEM careers. He co-founded Youth for Africa, a youth organization that aims to identify, support, and promote potential in young people. One of his favorite quotes, which I love, is a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. So Harrison, please do hop in and join us there, and I'll just pop that off the screen. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Awesome. So um, I have to know first, yeah, tell us about founding Youth for Africa. It just sounds like a, an amazing thing to do. How old were you and how did that get started? Oh yeah, I started, um, well, it's not just I, it's uh, Youth for Africa was co-founded by myself and a friend of mine called Awadi Milasi. And this started when we were in high school, like secondary school. Um, it was just, we were running a, a club called African Union Youth Club within the school. And, and while we were running, one of the things that we were doing is just trying to identify potential among each other. So within the club, we'll have sessions of um, some of us will be engaged in debate, some of us will engage in whatever talent each one of us had would be able to present. And we saw that was a really, really good success. And so as a result, we, we thought of like, how can we uh, take this experience to benefit um, other young people uh, around other schools? And so the idea of forming an organization came and, and, and we, we started uh, talking to, to people, uh, you know, we were young, but they didn't know how you can actually form a, a nonprofit organization. And, and we were able to actually uh, um, form one, uh, named it Youth for Africa. Um, and uh, one of our first projects were just, uh, again, involving around um, youth volunteering program, which is um, helping 
you know, others, you know, it's a peer to peer uh, teaching and then things like youth networks. So we try to expand what we already have, uh, we already had um, at school and that proved to be a success to other schools. Um, yeah, and then so on, we went with other programs that like um, youth awards and so on. But currently we're actually focusing on bigger problems. Um, currently we're working on trying to um, bridge the gap between uh, people graduating from schools and, and actually getting a job. So we're trying to bridge that gap because, you know, you are going to school, you acquire this knowledge, but sometimes there's, you need certain information to help you actually tap the opportunity that is available because there's some jobs that exist, but then we see so many graduates that are still not getting those jobs, you know. So skills, soft skills like um, helping with uh, preparing your CVs, um, you know, how to um, answer questions during the interview and all that. And, and this is through one of the program called Youth uh, Employment Initiative. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. And actually really relevant question. This came in, I think it's um, Zaid Mutasim. Um, thanks for this. Are there any virtual work placements opportunity for high school students that are studying IT? Um, yeah, um, good question. He, uh, he said it goes on to say a program that would run 35 hours would fit in the curriculum and provide great career exposure. I uh, totally agree. It is difficult for kids getting that kind of work experience and, you know, IT kind of jobs, as you see, can happen from anywhere. Do you, is there anything that you know of, Harrison? Uh, for Australia, uh, uh, currently I don't know, but uh, I think what, um, what usually I will do is actually go online um, and, and you know, studying, we, we have Google search and then you just type whatever you want. Google search has been one of my mentors. You know, I'll go there and ask questions and say, hey, Google, please tell me, um, I'm looking for this particular role um, and, and, and then read, just do a lot of research. Yeah. I would um, add to that too, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Uh, if you find someone on LinkedIn or, you know, who's doing a job that you're really interested in, um, just say, hey, you know, can I grab 10, 20 minutes of your time don't even have to meet virtually, but meeting virtually is great. Even just you do a bit of a chat back and forth, get some tips. Mentoring is such an essential part of getting into work and getting into careers. And, you know, people are not going to squash you. Like people are going to help and support you and lift you and, and, and bring you up. So um, there's also, uh, you'll see some links in there to, you know, programs that are running. But yeah, do, do feel free to get yourself out there. Um, I'm sure if you go to any kind of first year courses in technology, that's one of the things they're gonna say is, you know, network, 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 network as part of your course. Um, to go to your own pathway, Harrison, and yeah, feel free to add on to that as well. Uh, but I was interested because you didn't kind of initially go, yeah, tech is for me. You, you, you started out in civil engineering, is that right? Um, so yes, uh, in terms of um, as, as, a, as a young person, you know, just trying to find out what do I really want to do, the first thing for me was I think I want to become a, a civil engineer. And, and when I was in secondary school, that was my focus. Um, you know, I, I was focusing on physics, chemistry, and math with the goal of, I, I think when I go to university, I'll study civil engineering. But that changed and, and it, was, it was a simple thing. You know, um, I started spending more and more time on the internet. Uh, and at, at that time was like, you get to Yahoo chats, Hotmail chats, chat rooms. And, and so I started, you know, I'll just, you know, just trying to just chat with everyone. Um, and then um, I had some friends that uh, I would chat with and Skype with. And there was this question that bothered me. I was wondering how comes you know, I would send letters to my friends and, and, and it will take several days to, to reach them. But then I can actually send a message and within seconds, they can respond to that message. And that to me, I was like, what's going on here? Like, I want to understand this. You know, I want to understand how computer does this, how the internet works. And that became a drive uh, to like me actually uh, moving, shifting my interest, uh, just moving to actually like um, computer science. Because when I started just reading, I became more and more curious. And, and, and at some point, I, it was very clear that I was more interested with, with the internet and computers rather than civil engineering. And so I just made a decision that I would, um, I would study computer science. But before I made that decision, uh, back to your previous point, I reached out to people. I started, um, you know, I started asking um, myself, um, who are the people that are, were actually doing like 
any computer related jobs or have studied. And then I started approaching them uh, with the help of my family and friends. You know, I, I told the people around me what I like, what I'm interested in. And they even helped me to actually find people who uh, were in the industry, but also other people who perhaps in one way or another, they have, you know, they, 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 they're doing sort of things related to technology to just help me out. And eventually I ended up deciding um, that computer science was the best thing for me. And so I did my bachelor's in computer science. And then again, I still thought like I need to do more. And um, IT was something else that uh, I, I was very, very interested in because that's what I could immediately see myself. Like um, when I finish with IT uh, degree, then I can do a certain job. You know, like I, I was more exposed to IT roles rather than like roles like security engineering. I, uh, I mean, or like uh, software engineering. And so at the end of the day, um, I did my IT and then started working. And then after starting working, then again, repeating the same process, finding what I'm interested in, finding mentors, and then getting to know more about the field I'm interested in, what it takes to get there, and then started taking steps towards that goal. That's awesome. And you know, during that time, what were the kind of critical things that you sort of learned from your study and what were the kind of um, most critical skills would you say that you've learned uh, towards getting to where you are today? I think the critical skills that I learned um, at school and just, just uh, personally when I had free time, I think um, first is uh, programming. Um, I had to learn like basic programming. Uh, it, it's funny because when I was actually learning, I still did not see myself, like I couldn't, I was like, yeah, I'm learning this, it's good. I can make small programs, but what can I do with this in real life? You know, I think it's when I, I started full-time job at Google, that's when I, I, can, I actually saw the impact and I realized the impact of knowing how to program and, 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 and that changed things. Um, and then the other thing that I learned, I think um, was through school is just, leadership and through sharing um, our experiences, like, you know, I'll talk to fellow students, uh, hey, this is what I'm looking for, and then they'll tell me what they want. And then through that, I started noticing certain things that uh, as in like learning about software engineering, I did not know about software engineering until when I was talking to some of um, students that were doing computer science. And I was like, I'm interested in IT. And then they started telling me about software engineering. And I'm like, what is that? And they say, yeah, we're learning programming and then you can actually make softwares. And then that's when I started being exposed. So it's just trying to get myself exposed that um, by just talking to people and yeah. Who were the people who helped you most on your career journey? There's so many people that contributed, um, but I like to start, I mean, I think uh, the key people were um, family and, and friends and then my mentors. I think one of the things that when I think about how they helped me, I think they asked me questions that made me think more about what I want. So they'll ask me things like, what exactly do you want? You know, like, hey, in two, in two years, what do you want to do? Why do you want that? Where do you think you're gonna apply? Or, you know, the, the... That sounds like your family was like interviewers, you know? Like... <laughs> Yeah, and then and then and then sometimes uh, you know like uh, because some of the things I was interested in like when I was in when I was into cybersecurity, really uh, some of family and friends could not really like even they didn't really know much about cybersecurity. So the other question would be like, uh, maybe the other question you should ask yourself is who can help you? Because we we cannot actually provide the technical expertise. So who can help you? So start looking for people. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. so important too, because, you know, especially if your own family doesn't have that kind of connections, it's, you know, how do you reach out and reach out? And sometimes just taking those kind of little steps, like even like following someone and, you know, sending message, you know, being in the comments, you can start to kind of meet people who you can ask, who you can ask. Um, we talked before about accessibility and representation in technology and the work that we have to do to kind of get there. Um, you know, you're at Google where products can affect like a billion users. Like why is it really important to have um, increased representation of women and minorities in tech? Yeah, so uh, you, you just mentioned that, uh, you know, products can affect a billion users. So if you have a product that um, when you think about users, you're talking about uh, billions of users from different regions, from different backgrounds. 
it's it's very important to have um, the people who are making that product, that team, to be a diverse team. Um, this means that um, you have different ideas uh, that come in on how to make the product better. Um, the discussion that go on with any diverse team, it's, it's um, actually there's some research that has proven that mostly uh, teams that are diverse in terms of productivity impact, uh, it's a little bit higher compared to teams that are not diverse. Uh, these are like, you can just, you can Google like diverse uh, reports uh, and research, and this is actually clear on the internet. Um, so for me, but in particular, uh, when I think of, of diversity, and it's not just the question of diversity, to me it's diversity and inclusion, because uh, you can have a diverse team, but if you're not empowering uh, the people within the team to be and include them in decision making and and into in participating in, in forming the solutions that you need, then still you, you're lacking something. So it's diversity and inclusion. Um, the product that we see, some of the accessibility features that I think um, we they're very popular. I use, I tend to use caption when when I when I when I watch movies, right? But if you think of it, uh, that caption was um, if you look on your phone, iPhone, I think it's under accessibility. So it was actually uh, that feature was more um, to 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 handle people with disabilities. It was designed for them. But then guess what? It's useful for everyone. Yeah. I love those examples like curb cuts, you know, automatic doors, like designing for inclusion and accessibility makes everything better for everybody. It's, it's so cool. Exactly. And, and, and when you, uh, so for people who actually need, um, uh, like uh, um, the people who actually have a certain needs, when you bring them on board, you actually understand better their needs, but also they help design the products to fit not only their needs, but to, to cater for everyone. And I think that's why uh, I think uh, in, term, in tech uh, products should have, um, product teams should have uh, diversity um, included in them, uh, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about your career now? Like what's it like working at Google and, and what's kind of been the best part of your career journey so far? Um, I'll start with the last question. What's the best part? I think I think the best. What I'm doing right now, I think, is 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 the best thing that I, I'm, I like. I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. Um, again, I I I'm I'm defending. I'm a security engineer, so my job is actually defend the company um, uh, in for like intrusion. Um, I build detections, and this is one of the things that um, it aligns exactly with my interest and what I wanted to do. And that's why I say right now, I think I'm doing the, you know, this is the best position that I'm at right now, right? Of course, still there are other things that, are, uh, that I'm thinking about. Uh, so maybe in the, in the next two to three years, I'll be like, those things that I'm thinking about when I start doing them, then that at that point will be the best thing. Uh, working at Google, I'll say, um, one thing that I enjoy uh, and, and I really love working at Google, it's the sense of community. That's the first thing. Uh, and then, so it's the people actually, the people within the company. I work around very smart people um, and um, they're very, very helpful. Um, and we help each other in, in, in achieving our goals and not just career goals, even personal goals, right? Um, if you have any personal goals, uh, most likely someone else has a similar goal and usually you can find uh, you can, you can just send a message to like a group of people and say, I'm looking for someone who is interested in this thing or know anything about this particular topic. And then people will always volunteer to help out. And I think that's one of the things that I personally enjoy at Google. Um, I can see my career progression and, and, and my personal uh, progression and you know, in terms of my goals and the skills that I want to build. Uh, Google has helped me, um, like the people within Google has helped me a lot and they've contributed so much. And then it comes, another thing is just the problem that we're solving. The, the problem that I'm solving and, and think on how this, uh, the scale to which uh, this problem impact uh, has the, that big of an impact, it helps me um, be not just open-minded, but also my, the scope of whenever I'm being given a problem, when I start thinking of how am I going to solve this problem? This is different from how I used to think on, on, on trying to find solutions for problems. Now I'm not only thinking about, I wanna help this just for, for Google, but 
Google is a company that has billions of users. So I'm thinking more like I'm protecting uh, billions of users through Google. And, and, and yeah, and that's something that I really enjoy. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely, you know, I can imagine the world grinding to a halt if all of these cybersecurity issues did um, get through. There's some really fascinating work going on there. Just had a quick question from Felicity um, saying, can, you know, this session will be recorded, it will be on the YouTube channel um, and we'll be sharing that out. And you're very welcome to share that out after the session. Harrison, just before we move on, like, what would be your kind of one uh, bit of advice to students who are studying now and who are interested in a career like yours? I think um, the, 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 the first thing is just um, knowing what you're interested in. So in cybersecurity, uh, I said the first thing is trying to find people who um, are actually working in the industry. And you have mentioned before that you can go to LinkedIn and just uh, write a message to anyone. And I be, uh, trust me, people will respond. I've had people just writing me a message, asking me questions, and, and I will respond to them. Um, and I've also done the same thing. I have introduced myself to people and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, this is what I'm interested in. And all I want is just to try and understand more about this. And yeah, believe me, people will just say, okay, let's have a meeting. And then I'll yeah. talk to them. So that's the first, that's the key thing. Another thing is just, um, we have the internet. Uh, most of the resources, you know, it's you know that you need. It's available on the internet for free. So you can also like on your free time just start searching. You know, start searching, start reading slowly certain con certain security concepts. When you look, uh, when you watch the news and see, oh, there's there was a hack and and um, data was stolen from a particular company. Then you know, if you have time, read the report. What happened? How did it happen? And this will actually build more interest but also will it help you understand more like um, what areas within security you're mostly interested with. Because security is huge. You can, you can, you can build, um, you can build, you can just focus on building secure product, or you can be a person who all you're a gatekeeper, you're just making sure that no one, um, there's no intruder, but also you can be the person that um, who um, comes in when something has already happened, let's say uh, an incident has already happened, but you come in and say, I will tell you how this incident has happened. You know, we call them uh, digital forensic experts, someone who comes in and say, okay, the company has been hacked. Uh, you did not know how long this has happened, but I will, I will give you all these answers that this is how the attackers came, came into your infrastructure. And, and uh, this is what they did. And this is exactly what they were aiming for. And I think they're actually um, being able to fulfill um, their mission or not. They tried this and they failed and then they went uh, to another resource. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. And we'll hear some more from um, um, different areas of cyber security in a little bit. Thanks so much, Harrison. We'll get you um, in at the end for the rest of our panel just to answer any questions. So if you do have some questions for Harrison, chuck them into the chat or the Q&A. And I would just like to now introduce Ruhi Pelia, who will be our next speaker. Thanks, Harrison. So Ruhi uh, joins us now as a technology graduate from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. In her first rotation, um, post doing her degree, she's been working as a technical business analyst with her main responsibilities being to bridge the gap between operations and technology for stakeholders, designing and delivering digital solutions and data analysis and modeling. Having graduated from UTS in Sydney with a Bachelor of Business and a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology, majoring in Finance and Data Analytics, she is excited to continue growing her scope of knowledge in the STEM workforce by building further on her programming skills and joining in the engineering space. And I'd like to welcome Ruhi to join us now. Hello. Hello, welcome. Thank um, you very let's, much. let's start by telling us a little bit more about your job. So as a graduate, you get to go sort of on different kind of rotations and explore a lot about the bank. What, what have you been doing so far and how did you get this job in the first place? Yeah, so um, currently, as you mentioned, I am part of the technology and operations program, um, graduate program at CBA. So my current role is a technical business analyst. So I guess what that entails is really driving um, the digitization and simplification um, within the operation space is uh, the particular area that I'm working in. Um, so some of my main responsibilities are, as you mentioned, like data modeling, um, data analysis, 
and just driving those business proposals to really showcase, you know, how much money we're saving, how much time we're saving by implementing these improvements. Um, also engaging with stakeholders just to kind of communicate um, maybe, you know, because I am working in an operations area, maybe they're not 100% familiar with what the technical aspects um, that are going on are. So really communicating those with the stakeholders and making sure they're across all the changes being implemented um, and working on automation as well, which is really exciting. Um, so how I got into the program, um, you know, with a lot of graduate programs, it is a competitive and it is quite a long process as well. I think the key things are really think about, you know, how you want to stand out and also be a quick thinker because from my experience, you know, you don't know when you're in those interviews what exactly they're going to ask you. Um, and I think preparation is really key. So I think one of the things that I did was really research a lot of interview questions. And, you know, in most cases, they are like those behavioral kind of questions. So you want to be using the STAR method to answer those questions. Um, so anyone that doesn't know what the STAR method is, it's situation, task, action, and result. And I think from my experience, what helped me stand out and you know get the get the offer for CBA was being able to really emphasize on the result of you know whatever my answer was for those questions. Because I think some people kind of say what their action was, but they don't say you know, what was the positive result from that, um, from that, you know, scenario, whatever it was, or, you know, what was a positive learning from that. So Absolutely. I think that's something that really helps you stand out um, when you're interviewing and, you know, help me stand out and secure my position. So I was very happy about that. That is so cool. Thanks for sharing that, the STAR method. And, um, you know, I love that you can kind of use data for your answer as well. So, you know, I achieved, you know, twice the score for that. So, you know, yeah. understanding and communicating data is so cool and it's so interesting. What, um, what's kind of been, you know, your favourite or the coolest part of the job for you so far? Oh, I mean, there's a couple of things. Um, I think the most, the coolest, I think, is definitely just the fact that you know, you had so much support and so many opportunities at CBA. Um, I think as a graduate in particular, I think you probably have one of the widest networks um, of, you know, everyone at the company because you do all start together and it's quite a big cohort. I think we have around 150 people this year, um, you know, so you kind of can reach out and you have like that orientation week or like you know a couple of weeks so you have that ability to reach out when you're in the program to literally anyone and you know I think Harrison also mentioned this as well at Google but you know you can kind of reach out to anyone and they will respond they will help with your development plan um, and everyone wants to see you succeed you know there's no one sitting there that's like oh I don't want her to succeed you know what I mean um, so it's 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 such a great opportunity to have such great support from your managers and your peers and um all that sort of stuff so yeah really really definitely think that's the coolest part of the job and were you kind of a techie person how did you first get into your study pathway and what kind of switched you on to technology in the first place um I think I was always a bit of a techie person I think when I was younger you know I liked playing with like my toys or whatever but also I loved hopping on the computer and you know back then you know I used to be like dad do you mind if I you know hop on the computer and play some games or you know just like search the Didn't web you have and... your own computer you had to share with your parents oh, I know <laughs> back in the day but I've evolved since then <laughs> um but yeah you know back then it was it was really exciting to kind of hop on the computer and even like chat to your friends online on the weekend and I think that was really what kind of switched me on to tech in general. I think once I got to high school, I was kind of doing subjects like IST um, as one of my electives. And yeah, that, I guess that kind of just continued to fuel um, my interest in the tech sort of space. Um, and once I got to uni, I think my senior years in high school were definitely, um, I guess, what really, really pushed me into IT because I kind of went to those un uh, university open days when um, they were showcasing them. And I just loved how at UTS it was so interactive. Um, it wasn't just all theory based, you know, you got to do a lot of practical um, lessons, play around with like a lot of tools. And that was, 
think for me, I'm a very like interactive and visual learner. So that was really engaging for me. And it really kind of pushed me to want to continue um, in the tech space. And also kind of just having that influence from my family um, and my friends who, you know, also had interests or similar interests, I guess. Um, that, yeah, that definitely helped me as well. What made you decide to combine business with your technology um, study and how has that been an advantage in your work at CBA? I think definitely. Um, I think what kind of um, influenced that was that I thought it was a really interesting combination. You know, in a lot of instances, you're going to have, you're going to be working in IT, but you're going to be working for a particular business. And it's great to have that background knowledge of what the business structure is like, how they're operating. Um, and I think in particular for me, I majored in finance and I ended up at the bank, which was very convenient. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just a, a good combination um, when I was thinking about what kind of work I want to do and how I want, what kind of career pathway I want to take. Um, and I think for me, I kind of knew from maybe like my year 11, year 12 kind of years that I wanted to do data analytics. And I was actually speaking to one of my cousins who thought, you know, I think finance would be a good match for that. Um, just because you'd be able to, you know, look at those numbers, model them, analyze them and see what kind of impact they're having for the business. And um, I think at that time, I didn't really know that that was a role in IT. And that was really interesting to me. And it really um, made me want to kind of choose that kind of path. Yeah, I hear this a lot because you don't kind of know what's out there until you oh, get sure. there. So what would be your one kind of piece of advice for, you know, people who might be at uni now or, you know, in school or, you know, thinking of doing a traineeship? What, what would you say, you know, was one thing that's helped you along your path? Mm -hmm. um, I think networking is a big thing um during my uni years i was part of the women in engineering and it society and one of the big things i got to do was network with industry professionals at a lot of um just like networking events and i was also um partnered up with a mentor who was already an industry professional um and she was a great influence on you know the path that i took and um how i ended up getting where I was and you know at that time I didn't even know what graduate programs were and she kind of introduced me to that she said you know um she was a part of a different graduate program but yeah that that kind of introduction to that was um for me a really great opportunity to go online when I got home and start researching those programs and seeing you know what companies maybe I would want to work for um, and what kind of role that I would want um so I think networking is such an important thing because you know, it's it's a lot about who you can talk to um, and how they can help you, you know, achieve your goals and achieve the career pathway that you want to take. But also, you know, you can also offer advice to them. You know, a lot of um, students, they're in a very young mindset. And um, that's a really great thing because they have fresh ideas and they can also share those with, um, you know, some professionals and you know, you can kind of benefit from each other, which is um, a really important thing, I think. So networking is definitely a um, piece of advice I'd, I'd share. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Not only networking, but Googling grad, grad programs, um, mm -hmm. you know, straight after this. And I love that um, it is such a two-way street and, you know, you're right, like that kind of fresh ideas and graduates are really so valued in industry and really nurtured um, through industry as well. So definitely a great thing to look out for. Love to have you um, pop back at the panel at the end, Ruhi, to join us. Uh, but just popping on now to our uh, uh, dancing cybersecurity specialist, um, Kelsey Longan, who is joining us now from the University of Queensland, a doctoral researcher and guest lecturer in criminology. Her doctoral research explores the extent to which users of the internet of internet enabled devices recognize cyber threats, their response to those perceived threats and their use of protective behaviors to mitigate potential harms. As a, criminolo a criminologist by trade, Kelsey's previous work was in evidence based policing. Her research in this space predominantly examined how to increase police legitimacy, willing adherence to the law and the reporting of suspected crimes. With only a year left to go in her doctoral research, congratulations, 
Kelsey's future research objectives include developing practical and tailored applications of evidence-based policy across private and public sectors, which seek to increase cyber awareness and reduce the likelihood of victimizations in cyber crimes. I'm really excited to hear some more about this. Welcome, Kelsey. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I did start with the, the dance comment. You, you own a dance company. You started a journalism degree and were aiming to be a war correspondent. How the heck did you end up in cybersecurity? It's definitely not the most linear of career paths, so I'll give you that one. Um, and this really does come back to, I think, more of my background and my childhood. So growing up, I came from a single parent household and we actually experienced quite a lot of domestic violence. So back in the day for me, dancing was the ability to have escapism. It was the ability to socialize, to be fit and to really use this creative element. Um, so that's how dancing started for me. And that's also Amazing. where my, yeah, it's a very interesting story and definitely a weird way to cope <laughs> during that time. But that also really raised this want and desire for me to understand social justice and to understand why different crimes occur, who are the victims, and what we can basically do to limit victimization and to help that support. So for me, journalism seemed like the obvious choice. I really wanted to interview the political leaders. I wanted to be overseas where the war and conflict was happening and just understand what was going on and try to make an impact. So as a high school student, that for me was the dream. And for me, dancing was always there along for the ride to take my mind off of it when things were getting a bit too tough or to have this creative outlet or to just let off some energy. And as I was going through university, I got more and more involved in dance and I ended up getting a position where I could teach it. So I had this great opportunity where I could have my creative outlet but I could also make enough money to fund it, to go to competitions, to buy very expensive costumes when they're absolutely tiny, <laughs> um, while still pursuing my journalism dreams and understanding wars and understanding the modernization of warfare. So how we went from boots on the ground conflict to then using drones and using external technologies. And that's the point where I really realized this is probably not the safest career path for me. It was something that was very daunting. There were a lot of moving parts. How would you how would you get there? The different steps you'd have to take in this journalism pathway. And for me, I always just had that interest of I want to get back to social justice. I want to want to understand what's going on. And that's why I kind of stepped into criminology more general. And through my study, which was understanding offenders and understanding victims and understanding the social settings where they would converge and where crime could occur it really opened my eyes to there's so much going on with technology and it's absolutely changing our landscape. It's no longer, I have to be in front of a person. It's, I have never met this person and will never meet them. And I'm somehow connected through this computer or a phone and yet I can still be victimized. So for me, the pathway there was just this interest in social justice from this upbringing, wanting to understand why it occurs. And then also just doing something where I could make a difference really. And that's why I have eventually sidestepped into cybersecurity to understand the aspect of it, but dancing and having a dance school and being able to teach others as well. So, you know, even if you're not a victim of cyber crime, I can still have you in my dance classes. I can still have that form of escape of escapism for you. And I can still help people on their journeys to competitions and generally just have this creative release because looking at a computer screen all day not fun so getting out and dancing is, is still just a great way to get involved but very roundabout path so anyone who doesn't quite know where they want to be trust me you're probably going to end up somewhere else along the way in your career journey <laughs> what a fascinating story thank you so much for sharing that and to you know talking about the kind of motivation behind that and it's so interesting to think about you know the, the human interaction and the way that we use technology and that's such a big and growing part of the world. Um, going into your postgraduate studies in cybersecurity and now kind of being in that space, how has your non kind of tech and your other sort of skills played into that? How useful would you say that it is to have these kind of skills like the ability to distill information, for example, through journalism, the ability to understand the mindsets and perspectives of people using technology? 
It's definitely really useful. And I'm really glad to see that the cyber world and the tech world really has gotten to the point where we're interested in understanding how people are engaging with technology and where we're understanding that you can have the best technical solution out there. But if someone disables a specific firewall or if someone clicks on a link, then it's game over and we need to make sure that that aspect doesn't happen. So for me, having a background where I'm looking at how people engage, the psychology behind it, the different social situations. It's it's actually really, really beneficial for understanding cybersecurity, for understanding what practices we can do that step outside of this highly technological realm. But in terms of my study, it really has helped because as a journalist or as a trained journalist, you do take on lots of information and you take them from different fields and you're trying to create a very logical story. And that's what a PhD is, is trying to take information from hundreds of other academics and currently now a very um, physical based crime sphere along with this highly technical sphere and trying to put these solutions and information together. So having a background where you can do that, where you can understand different factors and how they interplay is really, really beneficial. And to give just a little bit more background as well about my research, what I'm trying to understand is I'm using eye tracking technology. I'm also using skin conductance, um, measuring heart rate, and also doing an emotional response from the camera. So we're measuring all those components and we're seeing how people actually respond at a psychological level to cyber threats. So the objective of this is when we put different types of say phishing or a business email compromise or a link to malware, if we put that in front of someone, what is your response? Because if we're in a physical setting and just want everyone to imagine right now, if you're walking down a dark alleyway or you're walking in a dark car park, what's going to happen is a flickering light or a noise that's going to trigger in you what's called some sort of a protective response. Your heart rate's going to go up, you're going to increase perspiration and your body's naturally going to go, this is a bad thing. Let's get out of here. Or let's increase the lighting. But the problem, and this is what we don't quite understand yet is what response do we have to cyber threats? Because they're not apparent. We see a phishing email link or we see something malicious and we go, okay, cool, it can't really hurt me. So the second step of that research then is when we understand what's going on psychologically and biologically, what is it that I can do on a computer screen that is going to get someone to actually engage to protect themselves and then to protect others? Can I get you to report it so that no one else is gonna fall for that phishing link? And trying to understand the social interactions and the relationships and what's going on psychologically and biologically, definitely very useful having a background where we're looking at society and looking at people and putting all this information together. So very good having a non-technical background, but also some benefit in understanding, you know, what are the factors of attack and, and what are the vectors that someone uses and, and what is a legitimate threat and how can we prevent it? So it's good to have that combination of things coming together. That is so fascinating. That just gets all of these ideas happening in my brain, such as why my reported spam emails are now yellow, <laughs> which is probably some kind of reminder that something bad's going to happen. And I really love that um, idea. That's so fascinating. I'd like to invite now my um, other panelists to pop back on and just in our last kind of five or six minutes, do pop your questions if you do have any burning questions for our panelists. But I'd like to, starting with you, Kelsey, ask, you know, where do you kind of see, this is such fascinating research, where do you see this taking us off in the future? What do you think, have you had that kind of connection with industry happen and where do you think that this might take you in the next five years? Absolutely. So I've been very, very lucky to actually start a part-time position at SEEK and what we're trying to do within SEEK is really understand how this research, how this information, how we can educate people actually does transfer into the real world. Because the biggest issue with academia, and as much as I try to do randomized control trials and settings that would try to emulate a workplace, it's just not real. So taking this information, using those concepts, using the theories and the underlying factors, having or working for a place like SEEK really does afford the opportunity of, well, how can we protect our staff members using this idea? And then how can we protect our users using this idea? What is it that we can do in a practical sense, in a cost-effective sense with the resources that we have that can in some way decrease victimization? So fingers crossed, that's where I can move to. And eventually, like fingers crossed, the end goal would be allowing 
pretty much every platform in the world to have something where we can embed those cues, where we can therefore limit risk and limit victimization just from triggering the underlying psychological response. Amazing. That is so cool. I love that idea of working with that real data too. Harrison, same question to you. Where do you kind of see yourself going in the next sort of, you know, three and five years? And just thinking, you know, people who are listening now might be thinking about getting into the workforce in the three to five years. Where do you see the opportunities um, in security engineering? I mentioned earlier that security engineering is such a big field and there's so many things that you can do. So I am, um, I love what I'm doing right now, but also I'm continuing the same process of looking for learning more and more like what other people in the industry are doing and then see if any of those things will actually interest me and then maybe try them out. So in the next three years, I think um, uh, so far, according to the current plan is I will still be working on something related to detection and response. Yeah, fantastic. And Ricky, for you, um, what, you what's your next rotation? Why have you found those kind of interests for you in, 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 in working as a technology graduate? And what's, you know, what are you thinking is coming up next? Um, yeah, so we actually recently just confirmed our um, second rotation. So I'll be moving to the engineering space, um, which I'm really excited for because I think during my first rotation, that was something I really, um, I guess I figured out I, when I, whenever I was working on, um, you know, scripting or any kind of more technical work, it was really, really exciting for me. And I kind of, um, I got up to start work really excited. So um, it kind That's of struck a light bulb. Yeah, yes. for me. Um, <laughs> so to cool. think, you know, maybe I can go into the engineering space. So um, yeah, that's definitely where I'm going next. And I'm really excited about that. Fantastic. Um, La, I mean, we've talked about networking, we've talked about reaching out, mentoring, um, the importance of kind of understanding that your non-tech skills are critical also in tech careers. Is there any one more thing that you would like to add to that? Um, maybe Kelsey, starting with you, Kelsey Harrison, Ruhi, just wrap up one more thing that you'd like to um, follow up with. I think definitely one of the most important skill sets that I found is the ability to communicate with different stakeholders and understand how different stakeholders are involved in a different problem or an incident. So my best advice is develop the skill set of the ability to ask questions, the ability to think through who is this impacting and who else do I need to talk to in the cyber world and where can I take this knowledge and apply it to a different stakeholder in the field. So kind of like what you were saying before, it's not just our IT professionals, it's our law, it's our psychology, it's you know different designers and engineers and really thinking about how can this impact everyone and how can I communicate and engage in a way that's gonna be most effective. Yeah, Harrison? Yeah, uh, I think another thing that I can add that I think to me has been very, very helpful is um, reading books that are, not, that are not related to technology. So one of the books that actually changed me, like I'll say it's uh, The Secret uh, by Rhonda Green. Um, it just, this idea that I can be whoever I want to be if I put my mind to it. To me as a young person, um, you know, no one has told me that. no one, I mean, people would say that, but I'll say you're just saying it, but reading in a book and understanding and having examples mentioned in the book on how people achieved what they wanted to do, that that changed, changed things for me. So yeah, trying to read motivational books. That's awesome. Really? Yeah, I think um, the one thing I would say is definitely think about what you love doing think about like what your interests are and kind of go for a job or go for a degree that um, aligns with those interests because what I found is you will really really enjoy your job a lot more when it's aligned with your interests and something that excites you and um, you know obviously there, there will still be you know days where it's a bit hard or like you know you're still trying to figure it out but I think if you really go for something that you're interested in and you're passionate about um you end up loving your job a lot more and um and that's I think one of the most important things going into the workforce fantastic we do have a question Anisha thank you for the um you know getting onto that detail of scams you don't actually have time to get to that right now but um do please follow up by uh checking out all of our panelists please join me in thanking our panelists for sharing our time today you can find all of their stories 
uh, online at Careers with STEM or in the Careers with STEM magazines. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Look out for our next webinar and um, do join our mailing list if you'd like to get information about these webinars. Don't forget to subscribe. We've got heaps of videos covering cybersecurity space and a whole bunch of different areas as well. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody for joining.